QuickBooks Online 2024. Advanced customer payment or unearned revenue method number one. Get ready and some coffee because we're going to be like bookkeeping Einstein with QuickBooks Online 2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our Get Great Guitars 2024 QuickBooks Online sample company file we set up in a prior presentation, opening up the major financial statement reports like we do every time. The reports on the left-hand side in the favorites. Right-click in the balance sheet to open a link in a new tab. Right-click in the profit and loss to open link in a new tab. Right-click in the trial balance to open a link in a new tab. Let's tab to the left. Close up that hamburger on the balance sheet and change that range. We're going from 010124 to 022824. We want to see it on a month by month breakout. So we'll select the months, run the report, repeat the process, tapping to the right, closing the hamburger, changing the range 010124 tab, 022824 tab. Bring it to the month by month breakout and then refresh the report. Tapping to the right. Ultra vase another time. One more round. Going from 010124 tab 022824 month by month on the breakout. And then we will run it once again to refresh it. Let's go back to the balance sheet tab as we discuss the new scenario. That being that we're sick and tired of selling our guitars on account and then possibly a customer not paying us, basically just stealing our guitar. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to require a down payment on the guitar uh, when they request the guitar. And then that will hopefully lock the customer in to uh, complete with the purchase of the guitar. Now, this will be an unearned revenue type of situation, which we can imagine in multiple scenarios of an organization. There's a couple different ways that, that we can do this uh, practice problem. Some, I think, being easier on the bookkeeping side of things. Some being more accurate in terms of the bookkeeping uh, side of, side of uh, in terms of the financial reporting side of things. Although I think both methods work. Because even if you do the, the, the method that's easier on the bookkeeping side of things, then you can always do an adjusting entry basically at the end of the period to make the financial statements correct in accordance with, say, an accrual-based method. So I want to jump over to a flowchart just so we can consider what is happening here. This is a desktop homepage flow chart that we're using for online purposes because we're just looking at the flow of the forms. And that will be the same for just about every accounting process. Uh, or system. So we're looking on the revenue cycle, where at the end of the cycle, we would expect to be receiving money cash coming in for goods and services that we provide. Now, normally, as we've discussed in the past, you have a system which would be the easiest system, which might be, for example, that you wait till something clears the bank. So you're just a YouTuber or something. You wait till the deposit clears the bank from YouTube and you record it possibly with the help of the bank feeds as revenue with a deposit form. That would be the simplest process. But you might be at a cash register, in which case, if we're at the cash register, as we could see in a restaurant, or in our case, in the guitar shop, for example, and someone uh, brings the guitar up, then we're going to ring it up at that point in time, and we're going to record the sale at the same point in time we receive the cash. But when we get paid, it might be by cash. We might get a credit card. We might get an electronic transfer. We might get a check. So we typically will, th will then have an intermediary step so that we can uh, batch the deposits that we have and then record them in the bank 
in the same format as will be on the bank statement. And then if we have an accrual system, that means that we're in some type of industry like a landscaping business, a bookkeeping business, CPA firm, law firm, where we typically have to do the books first and then we receive the money at a future time. So we enter the invoice when we do the work and then we receive the payment at a future point after we track the accounts receivable and follow up on it and then we can make the deposit. That's how most normal processes go and you can see what happens here is that we typically do the work before or at the same time that we get paid. However, a wrench is thrown into the system if, for example, we have a system where we're gonna get paid before we do the work. Why is that a problem? Because if we get paid before we do the work, then from a revenue recognition standpoint, we haven't yet rec earned the money, right? We got paid before we should recognize revenue because we have not yet earned the money. So the textbook example of this, uh, it would typically be like a newspaper uh, company where they have where they deliver your newspaper these days possibly most newspapers are dead because of one we have the digital uh digital news these days and two most of the newspaper people are so you know the the the, the legacy media is on its last leg and the, their leg is lame and so <laughs> if they're on their last leg lame lame leg so uh people might not be in as much uh buying as much newspapers but a similar kind of process these days would be in online applications, for example, because that would be a similar kind of subscription model, meaning people might be paying for a year's worth of subscription and you're going to be providing the access to to the software at, in the future. Another classic example would be something like a uh, entertainment where you're collecting money to have a concert or something like that. Well, you're going to get the money when you sell the tickets up front. And then the concert happens, you know, at some point in uh, the future. Uh, you also have situations where you might get an advanced payment in rental situations. So oftentimes you might structure a rental situation where you're going to collect the last month's rent or have a deposit, which is a security deposit, which is kind of another concept of unearned revenue. You got paid by a customer but you didn't earn it. You have not yet earned it or possibly you will never earn it because it's just a security deposit that you're supposedly going to give back at the end when they move out. But we know that's never going to happen. But anyways, just kidding. So uh, so then that's another situation where we have this kind of kind of we got paid without doing work uh, type of situation. And the other situation that we'll, we will concentrate in on more will be a situation where we have a large custom project that we're going to be putting together or a large thing that we're going to sell. So if someone wants to lock down, for example, a particular guitar that we have in the shop or request a guitar that we can order for them, then if we're going to put that guitar on hold or request the guitar, then we want to get a security deposit up front to make sure that they're really committed to fulfilling the purchase. Now, there's also issues that you could have with long jobs like a construction company, but then you get into different area because the revenue recognition concept could change altogether. Because if you're if you're talking about long term jobs that are happening over more than a year long time, then the question is, should you be recognizing revenue uh, at the at the end of when you finish the work, which is normally what you do, but because it's a long job, maybe you should be recognizing revenue basically as the job goes. That's usually kind of a different thing. That's percentage of completion, but it has the same kind of revenue recognition issue. So the idea is that now we're going to get paid before before we do the work, and that's backwards on the arrow, right? We got the payment. Usually we enter the invoice first, but no, we have to receive payment first. So how do we deal with that? Well, from a journal entry standpoint, what happens if you do this in a textbook, the common textbook scenario would simply be, well, you're just going to debit cash or increase cash. And then the other side is not going to go into revenue because you haven't earned it. It's going to go into a liability account of unearned revenue. So let's just imagine that on my, my financials here. So if we got paid from a debit or increase and decrease of an account standpoint, we would just simply increase the checking account if we got money. And then the other side would not be going to the income statement because in theory, we have not yet earned the income, but rather it's going to go into a liability account over here, which we might call 
unearned revenue. If it was revenue that we have not yet earned, we got paid for it, but we have not yet earned it. It's a liability because we owe the, the work or we owe the money back. It might also be called customer deposit in a situation like ours or a, like a rental situation where you got advanced payments for something that you're going to be providing in the future, like a rental or uh, the guitar. Now that's the tip. Now it's easy to think about from a journal entry, although it's still a little bit more complex because a lot of industries don't have that issue, right? But you could say conceptually that makes that makes sense because I have a liability, and then when I earn the revenue, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it out of the liability, and then I'm going to put it over here in income when I earn it, reducing the liability increasing the income when we actually provide the work, when we deliver the newspaper, when we throw that that lame uh, legacy media rock through someone's window and we earned our revenue, that's when we basically <laughs> record it, right? So then, so, but, but, so that's the, that's the idea. But there's a problem when you get into the software and that is that I want, if I have unearned revenue down here on the liability side of things, then that liability is kind of connected to the customers, which isn't normally the case. When I'm working with customers, the subledger that we deal with in the customer center is tied to the accounts receivable account. So if you create an unearned revenue account, we have an issue tracking it internally. If I go back over here in the what I would call the customer center, because this whole thing with the customer center is intimately connected to the accounts receivable account. So the subledgers get messy. So, so now the question is, well, how can I make it so it's easy on the bookkeepers? Because I want to I want to make it so the bookkeepers internally can track what is happening, receive obviously the money and then and then facilitate the invoice that's going to happen later. Well, the easiest thing to do internally is to just say, well, if I got the payment first, I'll just enter the receive payment first. And then when I invoice the client later, so when I, when I issue the guitar in our case, I'll just record a receive payment. And then when I issue the guitar or provide the guitar, I'll make an invoice, which will tie out to the receive payment that I'd received in advance. And that works really nicely internally, uh, but there's kind of a problem with it when there's this timing problem between these two transactions, because what does the receive payment form do? It decreases accounts receivable. But if I don't have an invoice to tie it to, there's nothing to decrease. So it's going to result in a negative accounts receivable. And you'll recall that's not what we want from a debit and credit standpoint. We want a positive liability, not a negative receivable. So you, this, the bottom line of the equity section of the income statement of the balance sheet is the same but we end up with this negative receivable instead of a positive liability. But from an internal standpoint, it works beautifully from the bookkeeper side of things because we're tracking everything with the subledger of accounts receivable and the customer center, everything ties out properly and we get what we call a credit. We can call it a customer credit, which from the terms of the customer is usually like a good thing. It's us reducing their balance or giving them something to apply to a future purchase. It's really just crediting accounts receivable, which is an asset. That's why we're crediting it, which reduces the debit balance account. But you know, that's what it is. So then, and then we can make an invoice when we actually sell the guitar and tie it out to that credit balance. So that's, I think that still the easiest way to do it. And then when you have this negative accounts receivable, you might have to adjust it at the end of the year when you do your, your, uh, adjusting entries and your external reporting, or you might not, because if you're a small business, you might not need to, the balance sheet for external reporting because you might just be using the, the income statement, right? And the income statement would be recorded correctly. It's just an allocation between the balance sheet accounts of accounts receivable and unearned revenue asset versus liability. Okay. Let's try it out. I'll show you what I mean. So we're going to imagine that, that, uh, someone wants a guitar. So I'm going to say drop down. And we're going to say we've been bitten too many times with with uh, giving the guitar on an invoice and then people just steal the guitar. It's ridiculous. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it, man. So what I want now is I want you to give me a deposit if I'm going to give you the, the guitar. So what we're going to do is we're going to say I want you to give me a down payment and then we'll order the guitar for you. I'm not going to order the guitar, this plaid, pink plaid guitar that you want. 
uh, because I don't want to be stuck with it if you don't if you don't follow through with buying the thing because it's gaudy and I don't want it in my shop. Okay, so then we're going to say this is going to be Anderson. Mr. Anderson is purchasing it. And then it says Anderson Guitars payment doesn't have an open invoice. So normally there would be an invoice down here. There isn't one. So we'll save this payment as a credit, meaning we're crediting the accounts receivable related to Anderson, which will result in a negative accounts receivable for that particular customer that you can apply to an invoice later. Since you don't have any open invoices, if you want to receive this payment without an invoice, uh, use the sales receipt. So we're not going to use a sales receipt because that would be then us selling the guitar at this point in time. But we're not selling the guitar. We're getting the down payment, a deposit. So 022524, the date. And I'm just going to keep on going with cash as the payment method just to just because I want to still put it into the undeposited funds instead of putting it directly into the checking account. Now, normally, what, what does an account, what does a receive payment form do? The first thing we want to keep in mind when we have a receive payment form, it, form is accounts receivable goes down. And usually we would tie that to an invoice. Accounts receivable is still going to go down, but we have no invoice to tie it to. That's why for this customer, we're going to end up with a negative accounts receivable just for that customer. Total accounts receivable will still be positive because we have other customers, but negative accounts receivable for this particular customer. And then uh, the other side is going to go into a cash account, but for us, we're going to put it into that good old undeposited funds. Let's see what that looks like. Let's save it and close it. And then uh, something's not quite right. Enter a transaction amount. I didn't put the amount in. That's helpful. $300. Thank you, QuickBooks. $300, we're going to say it is. All right, let's try it again. Ultra vase, another time. K in the world, paso. It's my Spanglish, my Spanish slash English. K in the world, paso aquí for crying out loud. Dios for crying out loud, mios. Let's go to the balance sheet tab and then run the report. And so now we have in the payments to deposit, if I go into that 300, then we have the 300. Boom. That looks good. If I go back, if I go back, the other side is in the A to the R accounts receivable, the AR R pirate account. That one uh, went down, so that looks correct. But if I look at the sub ledger, that's when it gets funny. Let's close. Let's go back, and now I'm going to make the sub ledger. Go to the tab to the right, right click on it, duplicate it. Let's open up another report supporting, backing up, giving more information about the balance sheet. Reports are on the left hand side. Closing the ham boogie, scrolling down to who owes use, the AR type reports. And we want to go into the customer balance detail. Let's do that. And the range is good, I think. So now the, the issue is now for Mr. Anderson, we have a negative accounts receivable, which is weird. So that makes sense because if I, but it makes sense because if I talk to Mr. Anderson and, and we have a communication, we're going to say, oh yeah, you have a credit balance, a negative accounts receivable in your account that you can then apply to a future invoice when you purchase. But from a financial standpoint, it makes no sense because you're like, wait, a negative accounts receivable isn't an asset. That's a liability. That means you owe Mr. Anderson money and you do. You either owe him the money back or you owe him the guitar to complete the process. So you see that that's where the disconnect is. But from an internal standpoint, it looks fine, right? And so the total accounts receivable is 19,511.50. And if I go over here, that should tie out to the accounts receivable here. So, so, so here's where the issue is here. So that works from an internal standpoint, but not from a financial statement standpoint. Now, when we actually make the invoice, when we get the guitar, we're going to net these two out and then we'll be okay. So it's just a timing difference between the point in time I get the deposit and I complete the transaction. What if the end of the year happens and I still have this $300 as a negative accounts receivable and I have to do external reporting? Well, one, if you just need to do taxes, then all you really need possibly is the income statement if you're a small sole proprietor type business. And this again is a transaction that the income statement is, is correct, right? The problem is between the allocation on the balance sheet between asset and liability. 
if you need to do external reporting to the bank or some 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 taxes that you have to do a corporate tax return with the balance sheet on it and whatnot, then you could do an adjusting entry similar to other adjusting entries, except there's not an income statement component to it. You would just increase the accounts receivable by 300, put the other side into the unearned revenue and then reverse it the next day. And that is actually a pretty good system to use because now you're making things as easy on the bookkeeper as possible while still being able to periodically adjust the financial statements to make the financial statements correct as of the reporting date, which is a concept we use all the time for things like payroll and whatnot. You have similar kind of concepts, right? I don't want to mess up the bookkeeper. Payroll's too complicated. Um, and, and when you have a lot of unearned revenue, it's too complicated. Let the system do whatever is easiest on the bookkeeper side of things and then make a periodic adjustment. That's that's my spiel on it. Uh, not everyone agrees, though. So I'm going to go to uh, the first tab over here. And then if I go into the uh, if I go into the customer now, let's go into the customer and look up uh, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson. So now we have this item that has been paid. So notice it says paid and it says unapplied. It's beautiful, right? It's, it's, I can see exactly what has happened here, right? All these other ones are done. If Mr. Anderson contacts me, if someone else goes into the QuickBooks file and Anderson's trying to explain what happened, we go, oh yeah, you have a credit balance. You have a negative balance here. Yeah, that applies to the next purchase. I see what is happening, right? And then we can make the invoice at a future time. Now let's do the same thing for another customer just to see a couple other ones so we can play with these in future presentations a little bit more. I'm gonna do the same thing, invoice. No, I'm gonna skip that, receive payment. Mr. Anderson, the word got out that we could do, we'll order custom guitars and now Sam the guitar man wants a custom crazy looking guitar and we're like, all right, but you know, you talk to Mr. Anderson and you know how it is we want a down payment. So 0225, uh, two, four, we're going to say, we'll just say cash is the method. Now note that he has an invoice to tie it to, but we're not going to tie it to the invoice because we're going to imagine this payment is for a down payment, not paying off this invoice. We're going to say, you still owe us $970, uh, you know, but now we're going to apply this one to a credit, not to the invoice. So we might not want to do that in practice. We might say, hey, give me the 930 and then order the guitars, what I'd probably say, especially given our past experience around here with it. But for practice purposes, I just want to show that you could have an invoice down here and not tie it out and still have a deposit with a credit balance, right? So this would be 250, let's say. So let's do that again. So I'm just going to say save and close. Wait a second, I'm going to uncheck this. All right, then I can save and close. I don't want it to go to that. So it's going to be decreasing the accounts receivable, but not tied out to that invoice. So you didn't select an invoice. We'll save the payment as a credit to your customer since you didn't select an invoice. If you want to record a payment without an invoice, da -da, and it's like, okay, cool. And then let's go to the balance sheet and run it. And then the AR accounts receivable, we have another decrease to the accounts receivable, 250. Is that what I did? I did it on the 28th before I thought anyways. And then the other side is going into not uh, revenue, but it's going to go into the payments to deposit. So there's our payments to deposit for Sam, the guitar man. Let's go back. Let's go to the first tab and let's go into the customers for Sam, the guitar man. And so here we have it. So now we had an invoice, but we didn't apply, notice this payment to the invoice. So this, this, we still have a credit outstanding and they owe us the three, the 930. We decided not to link those two together because this 250 we're going to say will be for uh, another, another purchase. So again, you can kind of see what's going on pretty clearly from the internal bookkeeping side of things. All right, let's do one more. I'm going to do one more. So again, invoice. Uh, no, we're going to go right to the receive payment. So another person came in and it's like, dude, I thought I heard you were had some super cool guitars that you can order with some crazy color. And we're like, yeah, but we need a down payment. I don't know. And so this is going to be Eric music. We're going to say 
on uh, 225. Let's do the same date and we're going to say cash down. So going to deposit uh, payment to deposit that customer doesn't have anything to put the credit to. So we're going to end up with a negative receivable and we're like, that's cool. I see how this is working now. Let's save it and close it. And this is going to go uh, something's wrong because I didn't put the amount in again. 200, let's say $200. By the way, you might ask, how am I going to know what the down payment is? Well, you, the first step on this, you might then is create an estimate, which is something I possibly would have been nice to start off with. You could say, let's save and close this. And once again, it's going to apply that out. And before I forget the name, let's go into Eric Music. Let's go into uh, Eric Music. So if someone, if someone came in and said, I want to order this particular guitar, you might hit the plus button and you could try to make a mock invoice to get an idea of what it would cost and then possibly collect a 10% down payment or a 20% down payment or whatever you want. But it might be even better to make an estimate. So you could enter an estimate and you could say, okay, I'm going to, if you want an, an ESP guitar, then, then, oh, hold on a second. And, and if you want an ELP guitar, we could say, okay, that's going to cost 500 plus 4750. And then you can use that to think about what your down payment should be. Maybe you'll take 10% of that or 20% of that, or whatever, whatever you think would be the appropriate down payment based on this. And then you can actually create the estimate. And, and if I did that, let's make this for Eric music. I'll show you just if we made an estimate, I might change it in a future presentation, but this will not record anything. This is an internal document. And we're going to say, okay, Eric Music had this. Let's change the sales tax to the generic five. So we say sales taxes. We'll just make it the generic five, okay? And then, and then we might use this to create the estimate. I, I'm, I'm sorry to create the amount that we expect for the down payment. So if I was to save this, let's save and close. It will not record anything. This is an internal document. We'll talk more about it in future presentations. But just to see the process here, if I go then into the sales area and we go into the customers for uh, the ones that have an estimate, I can filter by the estimates now. And I can see then we have Eric Music going into Eric Music. We then have the estimate in place and we have the payment. So when Eric comes in and says, okay, I, I, I'm going to pick up the guitar that you purchased for me. I already put a $200 down payment on it. Then we can clearly see, oh, they, yeah, you have a credit of the 200 and then you have the 525 is what you requested, which ho hopefully we have received now because we purchased it. And then we can create an invoice from uh, the estimate. So we could, for example, go into the estimate, edit the estimate, and then, and then basically I could select the drop down and convert to an invoice. So I'm going to close that back out. And so we'll take a look at that in future presentations. But the idea being, look at the internal representation. It's pretty easy to see internally, even if someone else was the one that recorded the initial transactions here. And then, and then a different person was in place when they're actually going to be giving the guitar. You can look in here and pretty clearly see what is going on. If I go to the balance sheet, then we can run the balance sheet and we can see, of course, that we had a transaction to the AR accounts receivable, R account. And then we're going to say, okay, there it is. Hopefully our, our accounts receivable, our customers are not pirates and they're going to actually pay us, but we're going to collect the down payment because we're going to trust but verify payments to deposit. And we're going to go into here and we're going to say, okay, so there's our payments. And then nothing's on the income statement. And then on the accounts receivable, we've got those two amounts that have the negative uh, payments in it. We also had a negative payment on another one. But so here, this one has a, uh, a negative balance, a negative, and then we've got a negative down here. So now we're going to have to so, so now in the future presentations, we'll create invoices 
which will which will uh, net out against those, which will make then will be good again in terms of our timing difference, and will also at the end of the months of transactions in a future course or pre or section talk about the adjusting entry you might do if you still had a negative outstanding balance and you were trying to do external reporting, in which case this should be a positive liability and we could we could do basically adjusting entry for it. Now, before we close up here, though, let's just deposit this, um, this amount in the undeposited funds. Let's just put this into the bank now. So we got $750. We want to get that into the bank because, you know, we've our, apparently our customers are also pirates. And so we want to don't want to have too much money on hand. So we're going to then go into the drop down and we're going to go into the bank deposit. And we're going to imagine we deposit all of these at one time on, let's say, 022524. And then I'm just going to select all of them. They're all, we're going to imagine cash. But if they were credit cards, then we might have a fee that we have to deal with. We can put the fee down below. But we're going to deposit them as one lump sum, 750 showing up on the, the cash account, which will match what is going to be showing up on the bank statement, match what's on the bank reconciliation and bank feeds. So let's save and close that and then check it out. If I go to the balance sheet and run it again and dive into the checking account with a click, diving into it, we see that we have the deposit now uh, in the system. I think we did it on, on 225, yeah, the 750, I think that was it. And then if we go back to the undeposited funds, undeposited funds is back down to zero. The clearing account doing its job going up and then back down to zero, not at the end of the period as a temporary account would, like income statement accounts, but at the end of a shorter cycle after it serves its function. All right, let's stop it here. We're going long. So this is where we stand here. This is where, this is our profit and loss. Nothing happened on the profit and loss because although we, we, select, we got money, but we didn't earn it yet. We haven't earned it. You have to earn the money before you record at least on an accrual based method all right so this is where we stand on the trial balance if your numbers match out to these numbers great if not try changing the date range see if it's a date issue we have the balance sheet on top of the income statement balance sheet accounts include assets cash is an asset accounts receivable inventory investments prepayments accumulated depreciation the contra asset which is linked to the property plants and equipment or furniture and fixture that's what the company owns what the company then or who has claim to the ownership, the other side of the coin, liabilities and equity. So that's the liability start with the accounts payable, visa is a liability, the sales tax payable liability, the bank loan payable liability, payroll tax liabilities. This was the sales tax liability up top, payroll tax liabilities, and then our claim to the assets, starting with the equity section, our investments, our owner's equity, similar to retained earnings if it was a corporation, and then the income statement, which should be able to be condensed to one number, credits income minus debits expenses, credits winning, and that credit if you have net income rather than a loss, and that credit will then roll into the owner's equity, which is like the retained earnings, which we can see if we bring it up one more period, 010125, 0101125, run it to refresh it, we now see that the owner's equity is at 87, 359, 85.